my mum like screamed from upstairs and says, um, phone an ambulance, phone an ambulance. Even sat in a room with just them, no one else. I would feel like they were plotting against me and stuff like that. That can't be true. And then you look into it and it's true and you're like, well, why Why isn't this on the news? I can tell you one thing. I would be dead if it wasn't for her yeah. on many levels. Like she 100% saved my life. I finished and I remember like afterwards, I was so buzzing. I was so like, hadn't felt like that for so long. Thank you very much for coming in, mate. Indeed, no I worries. appreciate it. We've been talking about doing it for a long time. but You know how it is. Things are busy. Uh, but we're here now, so I appreciate you coming down, mate. Simon uh, from Ace Podcast Nation. Indeed, mate. It's a long time coming, and a uh, brutal drive, mate, as well. Brutal drive. Yeah, especially road on the... Works, roadworks floor. I know. Mate, you uh, missed out, really, because in the summer, you know, coming down over that... Coming down there is actually quite beautiful, but... Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, this, this time of year, it doesn't do it justice, is it? Yeah, especially the last couple of days. It's been uh, pissing down, you know. I know. It woke me up this morning. For sure, but yeah, I want to get into it, really, mate. So obviously, you're a podcaster now, yeah, and uh, you're you're flat out. You do like three to four shows a week, every week, pretty much. Yeah, like I'd say, like three hundred percent every week, and then sometimes there's four or five, yeah, depending on. Like a couple of them are like every other week, and a couple of monthly ones. It's uh, it's nonstop. Is uh, people don't realize like how much goes into it and how hard it is. Not how hard it is, but how much time it takes up but um i do love it like i gotta say it's i said um i say regularly that uh podcasting changed my life and i think it did like it changed my outlook on stuff as well it certainly saved me but uh yeah i'm sure we'll talk about that in a bit definitely mate but yeah like you say we want to uh yeah take it back away from that for a minute go back to like uh your past Where, where'd you grow up so so i'm cardiff boy uh, forever and ever never left the place really if you can't tell from the accent yeah that's it no. <laughs> it's um yeah so i grew up in cardiff um brought up in rada i had uh, like up until age of sort of 15 like i had like the uh, almost like the 2.4 children upbringing you know like two parents both worked went to school had a younger brother everything was pretty good um, I think about, like, 14, I started getting into, like, probably 13, 14, got into a bit of, bit of trouble here and there. What sort of trouble are you talking? Fighting, smoking. I think not so much drinking then. I think I, it was, like, 16, I started drinking proper. Although the first time I got drunk, I think I was about, it must have been, like, 14 or 15, my parents went out on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, I had this mate, um, Sam, we'll call him. His old man was a copper. Is that and his actual uh, name or not? <laughs> Can't let, say. Let's say that. His, his old man was a copper, and um, he came over, and he was like, oh, should we have a drink at your parents' liquor cabinet? And I was, I'd, I'd, it had never kind of crossed my mind to do that at that point. And... Um, we just, I, I felt like, it, you know, I wasn't getting drunk or anything and all this. Just So we just drunk a ludicrous amount of liqueurs and all this stuff. First time I'd ever drunk alcohol. Um, and I remember I fell down the stairs in my house. And then we ended up going up, like, to the shops and the park. And it's, like, three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Like, my parents had gone shopping to get some carpet or something. <laughs> And um, taking my younger brother with him. And we went up the park, absolutely, you know, ruined, like, beyond belief. I think we were both, um, like, being sick and stuff and pissing everywhere. God knows, it was it was brutal. Um, and, you know, it was young as well. First time I'd ever drunk alcohol, even a sip. Like, I'd, I'd never had, like, even a sip of beer yeah, and yeah. stuff. And, uh, yeah, got to, like, taken home by the police. And I don't want to say that was the beginning, but, like... That was certainly a change in kind of like just I was all about football, playing football and watching football and going out with my friends and playing football. But that was like where I think the change went from that to kind of hanging around street corners and stuff and like hanging around with groups of people and stuff, older kids, and rather than going out at 10 o'clock in yeah. the morning playing football all day. I know what you mean, yeah. You end up, up like in this cycle, don't you? Of you out this Friday night, you out this Saturday night, 
Yeah. And then it's really hard to like, you can't take a step back from it, can you? No. You're in it all, all the time then, aren't you? Yeah. And like, I um I got to a point, like when I was like 15, probably 15, 16, like just literally like all, every night, all we, used to, all we used to do is just smoke all, like just any waking minute, like if we just had time, we'd just be like skinning up and smoking and skinning up and smoking. And I got to say, like I look back at that little period, like 14 to probably just around 16, was like some of the most enjoyable times of my life. Like they were really fun. Um, and, you know, there was some stuff in there that you shouldn't be doing and have been naughty. Like, But like in terms of just my friends, the people who I was hanging around with at that point, like they were close friends and they got me through some serious shit which followed quite soon after that. So, like, just kind of smoking and bunking off school and things like that. No debt, like, just devilment in it, really. Yeah. Just having a laugh just, and, ah, fuck the system sort of thing. And Very much so. Yeah. I was um, I was banging to, like, the doors and stuff like that. I had long hair and I was just sort of, I don't know, just, yeah. <laughs> Were you, like, stereo a rocker or? I was, like, no, I, I was banging to, uh, like, Oasis and Stone Roses and stuff still back then as I am now really and so I used to have, have like flares and I would sort of range from I'd have like dyed hair so I had bleached hair I had bright orange hair at one point but they was always kind of in like that Liam Gallagher type mod cut style like party the body like looking for yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was exactly like that but I just I would range in colors like had bright orange hair blonde hair all these different things and I then, can't picture it now. Like you, you oh, so I should have. Do you know? What? I should have brought it because, funny enough, when you said like the area that you lived in, I straight away said, "Oh, I went there when I was little. I used to play cricket, and I because I used to play cricket for like as like a teenager. At the same time, I used to play cricket for Glamorgan or South Glamorgan as it was then, and I used to play football for the FA School of Excellence for South Wales. So like I was all right." Like I was, ne- I don't think I would ever been have been good enough to quite make it. Yeah. But I also didn't have the, like I maybe I would have if I had had the dedication. But I was more interested in going to go and have a smoke with my friends or going to meet girls and stuff than I was to go to football training and things like that. Which was looking back now is devastating but yeah. especially like doing what you're doing now and you see like the commitment you need and you but I was exactly the same mate you know I I just I was more interested in going out drinking and doing whatever you know than mm. I was anything else and uh, I think that's just so easy uh, such an easy trap to get caught up in though isn't it oh big time mate and like I would always remember when I um, one of the first times I turned up to play a game for Glamorgan Cricket it was the first time I'd been there where I dyed my hair think just the way it had correlated it hadn't sort of added up and I, I was there and I turned up with like bright orange air and uh, the coach um sort of said uh, he pulled me to one side and he said oh Simon I, I notice you've dyed your hair it's um that's not the way we do things here <laughs> and I was like oh, okay but um it was just that like that was that was it was little things like that all the time which I felt like I was very much at the school and my parents and coaches and people always on my back they probably weren't but I felt like it was me versus or me and my two mates really versus the world and then um, then uh in April the April around my 16th birthday my um my old man had a heart attack and died and um sort of about I don't know must have been so he died in the April probably two months before I reckon um so me and my dad used to not get on we got on amazing until I was like hit puberty yeah and then it was brutal like and I look back now like he would try everything to try and make it work he would spend time with me when we were like 15 he took me and my mate down to the local pub and bought us a sneaky pint like he would try all these different things and you know probably stuff which he shouldn't have tried and did but he was well, trying to make that connection that we'd had when I was younger. Yeah. So um a couple of so a couple of months before he died, he said um you know Man United are playing Monaco 
in the Champions League on a Wednesday. Um, it was on ITV back then, wasn't it? So, like, that was something that we used to do together was watch the football. We used to watch Man he used to, He was a Man United fan, so we, we'd watch that. Um, so he says, oh, we'll go get some beers and stuff. And you can, because he knew I smoked. He said, you bring some of that and we'll, your mum's out and stuff and we'll shout out. And, and, I, and I was like, wow, that's, that's unbelievable. That's so cool. What a cool dad. Like, he's, you know, because there was always this one kid in school like there was always like in our year, I won't name the person like, but there was always there's always one person in there in the year who's like, whose dad like smokes weed or, or is like a drug dealer or something. There's always that one person oh, in the year like, yeah, if not five of them, yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> all, but there's always like them them ones. And like when you're a kid, you think it's like, oh, imagine how cool that would be if like your dad was like just smoking and stuff like that. Now like as adults, you like you know. That's yeah, not so probably, cool. Yeah, like, it's yeah, not so good. Yeah, like, but no. we um. So yeah, like when he had said that, like I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like this is going to be awesome. We're going to watch football. We're going to have a beer. We're going to have a smoke. And like we did it. Um, and he had never smoked before in his life. And he said, oh, can I have some? And just a couple of tokes. And he started like getting really sweaty and w- w- ill. And like. With experience, he probably like just had a bit of a panic attack and stuff, but um, he just spun out like completely white and, and yeah, and like but I panicked because I you know, I was a kid like and uh, so I like phoned the ambulance and said, "Oh, yeah, my dad, we smoked this and he's having a reaction, blah blah." blah. So the the ambulance came for him, uh, but then also the police came because I had said we uh, smoked right, stuff. Yeah, yeah. They started to trying to kind of go towards like him as if he was the one who had supplied it to me, and I don't remember this, but apparently I went off on one to the police, and um, had a bit of a scuffle. Uh, he went to the hospital to get checked out. I spent the night in Fairwater Police Station again. This is about <laughs> sixteen. Yeah, so I was sixteen then. Um, so that happened. Then the next day, I went to school. Everybody knew. Um, I was genu- genuinely, even though like we'd had our differences, I was just happy that he was he was all right. Like he had just, like you said, he had just had a bit of a white ear, and he had just had that sort of panic. I had panicked, and because I was stoned, it all went a bit tits up. And then when the police kind of tried to blame him, I obviously got a bit upset. Yeah, yeah. So that was that, and then literally. I th- I think it must have been, it was a very short period, a month, maybe two months later, I was downstairs, uh, just in my dressing gown, watching the wrestling, as it were, and uh, my mum like screamed from upstairs and says, um, phone an ambulance, phone an ambulance, for my dad, because he was just, like clutching his chest. Again, I like, useless under pressure, still am, but like useless under pressure, it was like, what am I going to say? Like, what am I saying? I don't know what I'm going to say. So I tried to phone the ambulance and they were like, oh, what's, you know, they're asking me questions and I don't know because it's happening upstairs. Um, so my mum kind of took that over and I went upstairs and kind of was holding my old man's hand um, and he was clutching his chest and, yeah, not uh, a pleasant experience no, for anyone, no, especially like. not for like a, a kid um, who was like 16 and then, yeah, he went to the hospital. He went like went in the ambulance. We went to the hospital. All the family and that turned up. Um, he passed away, and uh, that was the beginning, I think, where things went a bit like tits up for a while. Because before that, like I said, I was smoking and, and stuff. It wasn't I could drink a little bit. I wasn't really interested in drinking at that point. Like I just enjoyed having a smoke. Um, but then after that, I kind of was struggling and it was weird because I had a younger brother who was sort of 11, 12 at the time. Um, I was so concerned with making sure he was all right and making sure my mum was all right. So when I was at home, that's all I cared about was like kind of making sure they were all right. But as soon as I was out of the house, it was like the pressure just went and I would just still smoking ridiculous amount. I would not go to school. I ended up not sitting a lot of my GCSEs, like the school said, you don't have to you know, sit the sit the main ones. 
but you can not sit some of these because your dad's just died like you know a couple of months before the exams or whatever yeah. mate that must have been so hard at like 16 to, to be there see that like that must you know, yeah, it was i do really right? feel for you yeah it's at that sad. age it's hard to know it's hard to deal with at any age isn't it yeah yeah like i i, d- I don't think i uh would cope with it very well now do you know what i mean like if i had to do the same thing like sit with him and and try and speak to him and and that sort of thing like i really i think i would struggle with that now but what happened afterwards was that I had these two mates. Um, hope, hopefully, they won't mind me naming them, but like uh, James and Simon, they, they, um, they, you know, they, they kept me alive, mate. They, um, they just kept me going and tried to keep things normal, make sure I was all right. And you know, you're talking for a good couple of years afterwards, um, even because I didn't end up going back to the sixth form then after that because. Everything had happened. And that summer, we did, like, I did mushrooms for the first time. Had the worst experience. Because probably, like, I can look at it as an adult now, knowing more about it, that my head was in no fit state. You know, a few months earlier, I'd lost my dad. Also, was blaming myself that did he die because of what had happened the two or three months before. Like, if I just as he smoked for the first time ever, and then he's dead a couple of months later. That's yeah. that's on me. Like, he only did that because of me. I think when someone dies, you naturally, weirdly have guilt anyway, don't you? Like, everyone's going around saying sorry, and you're like, why you, Why does everyone go around saying sorry? Like, isn't it? it's a weird thing, because no one's actually done it. But I think, like, as a natural rule of us as humans, we kind of, when someone dies, we feel guilt, and we feel like we shouldn't be allowed to be sad for it for some reason, don't we? It's like, well, I shouldn't be crying, or... Yeah, Why? Like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I um, yeah, I yeah, I didn't really cry like on the funeral day and stuff like that. And I very was trying to kind of hide how I was feeling for my brother and for my mother for uh, for that, particularly like in that period afterwards. Um, but what happened is they did mushrooms at a. We went up the Garth Mountain and picked them and stewed them and ate them at the mountain, and there was four of us. And um, one of us had done them before, and then the other three hadn't. And um, two of them disappeared to do, like, they just went off and were having the time of their lives. Yeah. Um, and me and my mate, uh, we got lost up Garth, just tripping for the first time ever. Um, my headspace was where it was, and um, it was not a good experience whatsoever. Um, what sort of things were you seeing? Yeah. It wasn't really, like, I never really had, like, a lot of, um, hal- like, hallucinations and seeing stuff, like, you know, just, like, trails and blurring and, and colours and stuff, and, like, um, you know, like a kaleidoscope and that sort of stuff. Yeah. But what I did have was a shitload of paranoia. And that is something which, that affected me, I would say, until my mid-twenties, I had a problem with it because of, so I did it, and being the clever boy that I was, I also went on to do it again. I think, like, I'm not sure the time frame, but, like, relatively short period afterwards, we did it again. I had ex- exactly the same or similar experience in that very paranoid, very uncomfortable, very not enjoying it at all. So I kind of came to the conclusion at that point that maybe hallucinogens were not for me, and maybe... Just stick to smoking and I'll be fine. But what happened is because of those two things, and then, as I mentioned earlier, into the doors, um, and a lot of like that sort of music and that sort of thinking, and there was this, uh, there was we'd all had this kind of thing that we all really wanted to try acid, but it wasn't something which you could get readily. Yeah. So it had never come about, and then it just so happened that not long after the second mushrooms bad experience. It was like, oh, so-and-so's got acid. Do we still want to do it? Everyone else is sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we've been, we've been, this is, that's like been something we've been talking about for, you know, for the last year or something. Yeah, and I suppose your other mates have had a good experience on the mushrooms anyway, haven't they? Yeah, so apart from the one, um, he didn't do it the second time and he didn't do acid either. He's clever. See, he, he had one, but he got lost up the garth and didn't do them again. Yeah. Me, I tried to correct it by doing it again. And anyway, I was kind of went along with everyone, did the acid. Um, I didn't have as bad a tr- trip with acid 
like I just f I think it was more pleasant it was much less paranoia um yeah like it was not as bad but by this point the paranoia had affected me like and again I can say it looking back now it had affected me in like quite a substantial way yeah but I didn't know that at the time so what would happen is now after these trips or whatever whenever I would smoke weed I would get really anxious and really paranoid and I could be sat here with my, my two best mates who I've just told you like they got me through the hardest times of my life I, even though I don't speak to them all the time now I love them like no one else got so much respect for them because what they did when I needed them the most yeah and even sat in a room with just them no one else I would feel like they were plotting against me and stuff like that it was scary and everything yeah, that's going on in your so, head so eventually anyway like I stopped smoking weed started drinking and um then I discovered that I was good at that and um I liked it and yeah it's, it's <laughs> I worked in a pub as well and I didn't go back to six form I got a job doing like a bar management qualification and I was so I was in a pub all the time um it's like an emotional suppressor though as well isn't it? you obviously had all these emotions like on your mind from like your trauma or whatever because that's what it is isn't it essentially like that's a massive traumatic event in your life and then like I don't know every time something like that's ever happened to me I either try to suppress it when I was younger through like drink or when I'm older through like exercise or something you know I'm like I don't yeah, want to deal with that like I'm trying to block it out you know yeah that's my favorite thing and it? it's like even now I do it to a lesser extent like, I just try not to think about stuff, which I don't want to think about. Yeah. So, like, I just used to drink and drink. And, like, I'd go out with the boys and I would drink and just drink until I would pass out. And that was, you know, that's pretty normal for, like, an 18-year-old. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the problem was is that when I, I would say, like, I would drink every day for a start, which, again, is not that un unusual for, you know, 18, 19. But what would happen is that I would drink until I pass out. Probably 50% of those days in the week would be quite, I'd be quite like a depressed drunk. So like we could be in the pub and everyone would be like having a laugh and a few beers and I might be sat on my own just just thinking. Could be about anything, could be about everything. And I would kind of take myself out of it and stuff and you know, go back to drinking or whatever. And then that kind of developed into drinking before work in the morning, glass of just a beer or a glass of wine just to take the edge off. Mm -hmm. And like, again, looking back now, that's when you know it's a problem, isn't it? When you've, when got, to have when it, you've like got to have a drink to get through the day. So like you're talking like my early sort of 20s, like I look back now and I was, it was an issue. Um, and I dabbled in some other stuff, like casually, I would say. Like I had, um, there was one summer where I think I did like pills every weekend for the whole summer, like Friday, Saturday. And we, I used to go out on like Friday, we used to finish work, meet my mate in Lanishan, and then wouldn't come home until the early hours of Monday morning, Sunday night every weekend and like that just batters your body and because I was obviously adding chemicals into that the Mondays and the Tuesdays were just just this the come down and the hangover yeah. was so bad and so depressing that it just became like this cycle um and then I met my missus who's now my wife and that kind of all went on his head a bit because I um, when I met her, I had come out of a long term relationship, um, or fairly long for the, with the age and stuff. And I had kind of like I was like, oh, I'm not interested, and in, I'm not looking. I'm, I didn't particularly want to get married. I wasn't really interested in the whole settling down thing and stuff. I was starting to kind of drink more and more. I was doing a little bit of sort of and stuff on the weekend stuff which I normally or previously wasn't that interested in 
bit of a train wreck, basically. Um, met her in a pub, local pub. And um, we're all good relationships are started, isn't it? I reckon. Yeah, well, majority well, anyway. These days, yeah, it? that's it. That's where else are you gonna meet? I'm glad I, I'm glad I was able to meet her in a pub and not like have to deal with like online dating and all that. Tinder shit now. like God, yeah. Jesus Christ, mate. Online is just depending what you follow is like a cesspit anyway, isn't it? Oh. You know, you gotta be careful. Like it, it bring you down, doesn't it? I used to really like um, Twitter, but. Um, the last year or so, Twitter is just this cesspool of negativity and just fucking dicks. And made it really, I find it, if I spend too much time on Twitter and social media generally, it, like it really affects my mood. Like it drags me down just Same. seeing people's like negativity. And you always come across like stories of people who are like, they might be dying or they're, Recovery, because everyone's got a story, haven't they? Yeah. As you, you know, me and you know that probably yeah. as well as anyone. Like, everyone's got a story, but when you're seeing nothing but negativity on this stream of people, just people retweeting stuff, I feel like it really drags me down. Like, so I try again. Um, unfortunately, you need social media to promote a podcast. That's but, the um, thing, isn't it? That's the battle I have, mate. I have a dilemma in my head all the time of. You'd like to delete your social medias? Yeah, I want to get rid of everything. But you need it. But then I need it. But then why do I need it? I'm adding to the problem. I feel yeah. then, you know, and I'm like, I've got this like divide in my head. I feel like what I'm putting out is something that I feel could help people. Like mm -hmm. people telling their stories can kind of pull people out of their ruts. That's what it did for me. So I'm trying to put that back out for other people. But then you, you also get in this dilemma of like, I just feel maybe everyone would be better off if everyone deleted it. Yeah, yeah. But then at the same time, get rid of it that's completely. not going to happen. Like imagine if in, like Instagram shut down the other day, didn't it? For like what? A couple lost, of hours. Right? Yeah, People yeah. Were really stressing out. Like. I probably went on my phone three or four times and clicked on it and went, doesn't work. But like, imagine if that shut down forever. Like Facebook, Instagram. I just feel like you'd have so much better connections with all your loved ones, all the people around you. You'd make new friends. It would change everyone's life, I reckon. 100%, mate. Like, how much time do you reckon you spend per day looking at your phone? Well, my screen time is absolutely horrendous, like eight hours a day, because mm. I'm I've Cause constantly got YouTube on listening to something. Yeah. But aside from that, probably like two to three hours on Instagram, which is a part time job. You know what I mean? Like if you put that time into something that was worthwhile, and and I make the excuse in my own head of like, oh, I'm doing this for the podcast, I'm doing this for that, and like, yeah, maybe research, a, maybe a third of that is that. But you just go down a rabbit hole, mate. Don't you? If anything. Prime example, the other day um, on Facebook, you commented on uh, something to Richard Shaw about um, <laughs> North Korea. Um, oh, it was that the, the lady who was a guest on Young Joe Rogan Park or whatever, it? is it? Yeah, so I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I So I listened to the episode of Joe Rogan, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have a look and see if there's any documentaries. And I didn't want like a BBC or something like that, where you just get the usual. I wanted something which was going to show me stuff that I'd never seen before. And I've come across this, um, I think he was a Russian dude who had dub had his, he'd made, doc, gone into North Korea and kind of really gone places he shouldn't have and filmed it in secret. And then he made this documentary and dubbed over it in English. And um, I just I realized like four hours later that I had just spent like four and a half <laughs> hours on like North Korea. Yeah, just I know it's not going to impact your life in any no. way apart from like it just just watching that Joe Rogan podcast distressed the hell out oh, of me. I was like, like obviously harrowing, like harrowing, mate, harrowing. Like it's proper bad, and you know it's not talked about very really, is it? It's really crazy no. how that's people going just, on. People just let it slide. It's like oh, it's not happening to me. So it's yeah, okay. you learn in like history in school when you're younger, and oh, Hitler, like he's a bad guy. We all got together. We sorted that problem out. It's like. Why aren't we doing this? Is this is happening right now, right now in North Korea and China? But we ain't going over there and doing anything. No one's doing anything about it because China run the world basically, don't they? So what yeah. are you going to do? But like it's it's mad, isn't it? Right? Because like you say, that's going on now. But like when you really think about it, like how do you know what's going on in North Korea? It's not because um, like you were taught in school about um, oh, was it Kim Jong Il. 
Yeah. You weren't taught about the stuff that he does, the atrocities that they've committed over the years, the Korean War, no, nothing like that. I was never taught any of that in school. I was taught about, like you say, Hitler and World War One, World War Two. Nothing about, like, that part of the world. What about what's going on now? Like, why don't we ever learn about what's going on now, oh, isn't it? Don't get me started. <laughs> like, don't get me started on ne- mainstream me- media and news. It could be a yeah. very different show. Yeah. Than, like, I, yeah, I don't know where you stand with everything that's going on now, but fuck, it's mental, mate. I just find, right, this is the way I look at it. It's like, when I was younger, journalists and news reporters reported the news and journalists would, would expose people who were doing things wrong. Like, they'd go undercover, they'd do, like, a big story, and they'd expose people for corruption and all these different things. Now, they just seem to trot out, like, celebrity nonsense um, and fear. And that's this is why I don't watch the news and I don't read the papers, because it's just fear constantly. Just, like, be scared of this. Be scared of that. You're going to die if you do this. False widows are coming in September because it's winter, <laughs> so you stay in your house because all the sp- killer spiders are coming. And, oh, it's just constant. And the only reason is for for me, and it's only my opinion, I just think the only reason that they would churn out fear is to kind of stop people thinking about other stuff, which is probably more important and it's like a control thing, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. It's it, it is, mate. And the thing is, though, I don't know if you found, but once you've opened your mind to the fact that it's about control and yeah. keeping and you in lie. your box and they lie, it's really hard to close that mind to believe anything they're saying. I, I really struggle, like, I really struggle with trusting them, yeah, trusting what they say. When they're, like, lying to you, to you and then couple of months down the line, they pull out a little thing of that was wrong, but no one ever pays attention to that. And then you believe the next thing you they say, and then you believe the next thing they say, and then it, you, you find out it's all bullshit, but you st- everyone still goes forward believing what they're saying. I'm just, like, losing my mind, thinking, yeah. like, what the fuck is going on? But the thing is, that what you'll find as well is that every time they apologise for getting something wrong, or every time they apologise for, like, reporting a story wrong, or, or they've lied, or they whatever it may be, that'll be, like, a little paragraph on page 10. Yeah, but the original story, like castigating some celebrity or someone accusing someone of something or whatever it may be, that's front page, first five yeah. pages of the paper. Like it's yeah, yeah, that's on page ten, and the nine pages before it are more lies they're gonna have to yeah. apologize for. Like, that's it, man. <laughs> like it's brutal, and um, I find it very difficult because, like, you know, I, I, um, I don't when I'm, my podcast is like I've done on conspiracy theories. I haven't done it for a while. It's on hiatus. Because I was finding it difficult to, it's like you go down a bit of a rabbit hole with that. And like, I find it frustrating, first and foremost, because I'm like, you start looking at, into various stuff and you're like, that can't be true. And then you look into it and it's true. And you're like, well, why, why isn't this on the news? Like, why isn't people saying this? And why aren't people talking about this? And I find it distressing. So I just kind of I put it on the back, back seat because it was just irritating me a bit. I know what you mean, mate. Yeah, it can take over your life, can't it? Yeah, but big time. That's uh, back to you, I think. Back yeah, to, uh, was it you just met your missus in the pub? Yeah, so I met my missus and um, we kind of danced around each other a little bit, metaphorically speaking. And we kind of, we, you know, we <laughs> spoke. Strip club she was, yeah, she was, <laughs> well, she was working there. I was drinking there. We would have a bit of a, a flirt. We, you know, we got on quite well, but we didn't quite, we were like, we weren't quite in the same friendship circle. We were like, in a two separate circles, which would occasionally interact in the pub, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then one day, um, we were at the pub. I think we'd watch the rugby in the afternoon, and I had gone with a couple of the boys to a different pub because I had made the decision that she wasn't really interested, so I was going to go because I was only hanging around at that point and not going with them because I wanted to be with her. Um. And then about an hour later, at this other pub, I got a phone call from my mate, Ben, and he said, oh, um, come back. Like, she wants you to come back. I was like, oh, just saying that because you're in the pub on your own. You want me to come back to the pub? Like, and he said, no, no, really. And I kind of, this weird thing happened then where, like, I went back to the pub, excited, thinking, there we go, it's finally going to happen. 
And then I was just we were just talking from what I can remember. And we had a couple of drinks, and then for somehow we ended up talking to um, Willie Boland, uh, ex Cardiff City and uh, Irish midfielder, because they all all the Cardiff players used to drink in that, that pub. Um, and we just remember we were sat at like a table like this in the pub. Willie Boland and his missus, and me and my wife, now wife, who I was so was so interested in. And we had kind of just like danced around it. And it was in the end, Willie Boland just kind of said, why aren't you together? And we were like, yeah. And he kind of told us straight, like, you don't know how long, you know, you don't know how long you're going to be here. You don't know how long you're going to be alive. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if things are going to go bad or good. Just do it. Just go and, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But don't wait or, like, take a chance, innit? And we yeah. did take a chance. It was a bit, we've had some uh, rocky times. Like, uh, I can tell you one thing. I would be dead if it wasn't for her yeah. on many levels. Like, she 100% has saved my life. Um, first and foremost, like... Um, we had our first son, and like as soon as she was uh, pregnant with my first son, I s- straight away was like, no, no more chemicals, no nothing. I was not having it, and like I wasn't at that point. I was that was more of a, a weekend, like a casual thing. If it was there, it was there. If it wasn't, it wasn't. Like, and I slowly s- stopped drinking. Like every day, and I had more interested in spending time with her. And then my, by the time my son came along, I was drinking very little, and I kind of just ended up getting to the point where I was like, I feel better. Like I feel pretty good. I got a newborn baby. I got a good job. I got a missus who I am madly in love with. Like. I just it was the first time in my life or certainly since I was like 16 where I didn't feel like I needed to quiet my thoughts and stuff like that content like yeah so I mean jumping about a bit we obviously um we had another son uh two years later and like by that time I wasn't not drinking at all like now I will have a drink on my birthday and I have a drink on Christmas day and that's it I don't really drink all year round unless it's a particularly uh, special occasion or something. I'm in the same boat these days, mate. (laughs) For for me, I just find it doesn't add anything to my life. Yeah, Yeah. it makes me feel worse. Um, And like really as well, like because of the medication which I have to take now, um, I'm not supposed to drink anyway. So like, and I've got Crohn's disease, which means I'm not supposed to smoke or drink. So there's all these different aspects but like the my second son was born um and then 2008 we got married which again like i had gone from not looking for a relationship never been interested in getting married or settling down i had two kids i was getting married i got married um and then two weeks later uh, we were going to the mighty bush festival up in kent so we drove up on the Friday, uh, me, my missus, my brother, and my cousin. I was driving, and um, I forget, I'm shocking with geography and roads, but <laughs> the m- big motorway up by Kent, basically, might be the M1, but that, that could be wrong as well. Um, hey, I don't travel outside of Wales very often, to be honest with you, so I mean, I'm not, I don't I'm like not the best with uh, location. I don't like driving, and you'll n- understand why in about 30 seconds, but... Um, so we're driving up to this festival on the Friday night. So we're driving to the hotel, basically. And um, I'm in the middle lane. And there's a lorry in front of us. And it's like swaying and swaying back and forth. And I'm like, what the fuck that? So I've gone. And in hindsight, I wish I had just pulled into the inside lane. But I went around it. And as I've gone around to overtake the lorry, he's kind of swayed a little bit as well as I've gone level with him. And I've gone. If he, I really thought he was gonna like sideswipe us, so I put my foot down, and we just gone over like a little, like a hump in the motorway, basically, not like a full on hill, just a hump where you. And as I've gone over the hump, there's been an accident further up, and all the traffic has come to a complete halt, and I've accelerated to go around the lorry, 
smashed it, you know, slammed my brakes on, gone into the back of a car in front, car behind us has smashed into the back of us. Big, I think it was about five or six car pilot. Fucking hell. Um, my missus was pregnant by like, I think she was like four or five weeks pregnant at the time. Um, her head went through the windscreen, but where she was like in the early stages of pregnancy, she had um, been taking her seatbelt on and off because she was really uncomfortable. Literally like, I don't know, like 30 seconds, a minute before she had had not had her seatbelt on. She had only just put it back on. And even with her seatbelt on, her head hit the windscreen. She She's still got glass in her forehead to this day. Um, so, yeah. So, I was the, the lorry driver, by the way. Was, was, sorry, if you drove off. Yeah. Drove off. Yeah. So, we don't know whether he was falling asleep, drunk, whatever. He just left. Um, so, we've got out the car. I've gone, me and my missus have gone to the car in front. My missus got like blood all over her face and stuff. We've gone to the car in front, which we've gone into the back of, and there's like a woman, and she's cradling her son, who must have been, I don't know, he was he was like older than a toddler, like probably ten or something. Um, and I cannot tell you, mate, that split second, how fucking traumatic that was, thinking that like that boy was like dead, like it was. Horrific, I fucking it's only for a split second because obviously, like it was just basically shock. I think and I think he had some like they had some minor injuries and stuff, but generally, they they were all right. I was then switched, you know, to my missus. I was like, right, let's get you sorted. We need to go to the hospital. You're also pregnant. Just need to get that checked out and stuff like that. I was in bed pain, but I was like. My neck was hurting, my back was hurting, and my hip and all that. I was like, oh, I'm more, just all my focus, adrenaline, everything was on her. So Friday, so we sort of went to the festival on the Saturday. Do you, yeah? Yeah, we hired a car. The thing is, we were all from Wales, weren't we? And we are in Kent, and we had no transport or anything. Yeah. I was the only one who could drive. I did not want to drive, but I had no choice because we had to get home. Just, just to go yeah, back go. a little bit, did, did you... Well, were you full on on throttle when you hit? Or? Pretty much, yeah. And like they were I dead stop. My, all slam, they were dead stop, and I slammed my brakes on, and we just were going at such a speed that there's no, it, yeah, there was no, there was nowhere to go. Made that moment as well, seeing that it's kid like slow like, motion, yeah, break your heart, well. isn't it? Yeah, uh, that is um, one of the worst like split seconds of my life because for such a small amount of time, it's mad how so much can go through your mind. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Like yeah. because it was literally just a split second before he would have moved or like she would have said something or something. Because you know, he was fully conscious and he was everything. He was just he was laid like on her and she was cradling him like that. Comforting him. But for a split second it looked like someone, you know, holding her. Yeah. Someone yeah, who was yeah. unconscious. And you're like, thinking the yeah, worst at that point, you aren't you? Yeah. The adrenaline's flying and then like it was brutal. Um so I've gone back to work the next week and I'm limping around. My hip's bad and I'm like, oh, it's sore. I'm sure, you know, it'll pass. Um, so that was July 2008. Um, by September of the same year, or in a day in September that year, I woke up um, and it got, like, the pain had got worse and worse in my hip and my back. Um I woke up in September, I couldn't feel anything from the knee, knee down in my back. Completely just gone, just none. It was just one day out of the yeah, blue. Like it, I, the pain had got worse and worse, and I think I'd had like some tingling in it. But like, it was so much pain. I was limping around like I was 80. And uh, yeah, I woke up, I couldn't feel my foot, went to the hospital. Went, I was in... Heath for two weeks having all sorts of scans and x rays on my back, like literally every possible scan you can have. They told me, um, so I'm on morphine and I'm on crutches and having to use a wheelchair sometimes because I didn't like it. Um, but I was on crutches. They told me after the two weeks of being there, um, we've done all these scans, there's nothing 
on these scans that that you know there's nothing there basically it's just um inflammation and you know from a crash or whatever so you do physio twice a week and you'll be you know it'll gradually get better what do you do you listen to the doctor yeah you listen to what they're telling you because that's what you've been brought up to do isn't it if you go to the doctor they say this is what'll get you better whether it's medication or it's physio or whatever so i did physio for two two uh, twice a week as best i could for about a year maybe eight months got worse and worse and worse i had to use the wheelchair a lot I was on crutches my missus was having to wash me dress me sometimes feed me um now you're talking she was two weeks into marriage when this accident happened so she had like sickness in health in the first year to the point where like we were a, a young couple two kids expecting a third and she was pregnant at the same time by the way the baby was okay and all the accident and everything uh yeah so like and he's my third son now so he's like um 12 now so yeah and again could have been a very very different outcome to that side of things like it was a difficult difficult i think is an understatement but like i say she went from or well, we both went from like married life like new to it getting ready to like really build a life together and all these plans both had good jobs and uh yeah, she was then dressing me, washing me, all that sort of stuff. Suddenly, we had to have uh, a stair lift put into the house. Like I wasn't even thirty, and I had to have a stair lift and all this stuff. So, so what's happened uh, then is that because I, as I mentioned, I've got Crohn's disease. So I'd been seeing the same consultant from around the age of sixteen, really, about stomach issues. Um, and when I went to see him in the January of the next year. Of two thousand and nine, he kind of said, "You look like you're struggling. Like you look dreadful." Um, and you know he could because he had known me for quite a long time, yeah. had seen me quite you know for ten years or whatever. He said, "Right, I want you to go and see this rheumatologist up in Randolph Hospital." And I was like, "Well, they've told me there's nothing wrong. Like there's nothing they can find. Yeah. It's got to be like, isn't it? It's got to be." Think, you? So cut a long story short, went up to see this guy, said, right, the first thing we need to do is get this your back scanned. And I said, well, they've done all that. And he said, yeah, but the, the main scan of your like lower back is blurred, so you can't actually see if there's any damage to the discs and stuff of your back. Did another scan. Uh, one disc was completely compressed on the nerve, and another disc had like leaked all the fluid out of it, which is why I, you know, why I have and had so many issues. Um, so yeah, that was that. Um, but at least at that point, like I had a reason why. So like, apart from the difficulty of going through it all, one of the things which was messing with my head big time was that they kept telling me there's nothing there, like there's no read, there's n there's no broken bones. There's no damage to the discs. You just you just do physio and it'll eventually it'll get better. Is that like feeding into your paranoia from yeah, when you were time, younger? Because like, yeah. they were effectively telling me that it's in your head without saying it. Because they tell they're saying, look, there's nothing on the scan. There's nothing. There's no reason why you're not able to move. You know, you can't feel your leg, but there's no reason for it. Like, it's what am I, what's supposed to do with that? Like my what? Do you think I want my missus to have to dress me and, and wash me and stuff? Like, well, I'm getting something out of it. But um, 2013, then I had a sp eventually I had like different injections then over the next couple of years as they tried to fix it without surgery because obviously spinal fusion is quite a serious um, surgery or whatever. So because my I was quite young, they were trying to work out ways to avoid it. They did different injections. They'd help for a little bit so I could like move my leg and stuff and my toes. But a lot of the nerve damage around my back was permanent because I, when I was doing the physio twice a week, I was because it was so uh, so brutal and I was doing things that I probably shouldn't have been doing. 
it was causing more damage to the nerves and stuff like that and I was falling over I was falling downstairs I was on crutches and falling because I was doing far too much for someone with the injury that I had just put yeah putting a plaster on it but not actually yeah they were telling me to do physio twice a week on a spinal injury that wasn't being treated basically um so yeah I had spinal fusion in 2013 and I worked my absolute bollocks off to get I my aim was if they don't if it doesn't like fix it all which I they had sort of prepared me for the fact that's probably not going to happen because it's the length of time and the long term damage my aim was I wanted to stop using a wheelchair and get off crutches no matter what that I did I was just going to do it and I managed to, to do it in the physio after the surgery. So I walk with this trusty, uh, my trusty walking stick, which uh, I always get funny looks when I um, park up in the disabled bay. People always stare at me as if I'm like taking a piss, like because I'm parking in the disabled spaces. But um, yeah, I can't, um, I can't walk very fast still. And I can't, you know, I live, like every day is, I mean, like agony. And some weeks are worse than others, but compared to where I was for that period from 2008 to 2013, it's like night and day. Like when I think about what my missus had to go through when she was pregnant as well and dealing with, you know, bringing up our other two young kids and having to do all that for me, it's uh, it's quite upsetting. Like, and um, strong woman, mate. The best, the absolute best. But like, all of this took a massive toll on my mental health. And like, when I said about like the paranoia and stuff taking a long term effect, like it really, like paranoia and my mental health just got progressively worse from drinking and smoking and drugs and all this different stuff. My dad died and not dealing with it. Because I didn't deal with it whatsoever. I didn't grieve. I didn't do any of the things that a healthy, healthy way of trying to deal with, you know, a loved one passing. And um, so I saw I saw a therapist. Uh, I've seen a therapist twice now, I think. The first one, I, like, wrote a letter to my dad and stuff. And it was a bit weird for me, like, because I was like, it feels like I'm watching, like, something on TV or something. Like, it didn't feel... I don't know. Out of body experience yeah, with it. Was it, was, it was really strange. Like, I just, it wasn't something which I would do, but it helped a lot, I think. But, like, I was ready to go, like, at certain points. Like, I, the, the, and, like I said, like, my wife was doing all this stuff for me, and I was dealing with all this stuff. And of course, I'm skirting over loads of it. There was days, there was weeks where it was felt impossible. It was brutal. She was crying, I was crying. You know, it was it was hard. It I'm skirting over a lot of it, and like those that particularly that five years between oh, 2008 from where the accident and the surgery in 2013 was like the five longest years of my life. It was brutal. I, I can only imagine because it's a weird thing, right? I've I've had nothing in in comparison, but like I had like a seizure a couple of years ago and then ended up taking my license off me. Uh, I didn't lose my job completely, but I couldn't do the job that I trained to do. I had to do something else, which wasn't like very inviting or whatever. And that's like quite mine. That's minor compared to what you went through. Mm. But just having that, like your freedom off you. and like you, you, you've got like this sense of like you control your life. Yeah. And then once that's taken from you, like, especially in the scenario you're in, I couldn't imagine, like, you just feel, I don't know, when you're young, you feel invincible, don't you? And then when that gets taken away, it's a weird feeling, isn't it? Yeah, big time, mate. And, what, like, the other side of it, which I haven't really mentioned, is, like, from the age of 16, I worked full-time. Like, I'd always worked. I'd always worked and got my own money, and it was for beer and weed and whatever, but I, was, I always worked to get my money. And I'd always worked full time. And then suddenly I had to stop going to my job, which I really enjoyed. And eventually I lost it because I couldn't go. And 
I had all that taken, like it was just, it was taken off me and I had no say in it. Yeah. Like I couldn't stop it happening. I was just like watching as I just get these letters or I'd have these meetings and they'd be like, yeah, you know, it's just one of those things we can't, you know. It knocks you like self-worth though, doesn't it? Yeah, and we got to remember from, from my manager's point of view at the time where I was working is like when you're updating them on the, the health side of things, I've got to, I'm telling them what the hospital's telling me which is nothing on the scans. We don't know, just do physio twice a week. So they're like, well, why can't you, you know, why aren't you recovering? Why aren't you doing this? And I see it from their point of view. Of course I do. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's one of them. But I was rare. I, a few times I felt like I was at the end of my tether um, and my, my missus would just sometimes... She'd have a chat to me. Sometimes she would just say something, make me laugh, and that would be the difference between me being ready to go and me being like I could never leave her. Yeah, give you that spark of life. Yeah, like, yeah. like she makes me laugh every day. But like, um, so yeah, about three three years ago or so, again I was really struggling. I was just like I felt like I was waiting to die because I just thought like get up, can't do anything, can't do any exercise, can't go anywhere, I can drive, but I can't walk anywhere, I haven't really got any mates now, like I, I've got mates who I could speak to if I wanted to, but like, everyone's got families now, everyone's kind of like, when I stopped going out as much, they were still going out, and it's no fault of their, you know, no fault of their own, they, they weren't having the issues that I was having, I understood that, but like, you just gradually drift away a little bit, and I, I did, you know, I, I separated myself from it as well because I needed to, yeah, like drinking and stuff like that. But I also lost contact with everyone really, um, and I, I was, that was, uh, yeah, like three years, three or four years ago, I think, I was done. Is that I, your lowest point then? Yeah, I just felt like I was waiting. It just felt like I was just, what am I doing? I'm just waiting waiting to die. Just slowly, just each day, I'm in pain, take painkillers, feel like shit, cry, get angry. Do, do you like, um, a lot of people subscribe to the idea of it being a selfish thing? You know, like them thoughts. Like, I'm not one of them people. Yeah, no, no, I know, I um. But a lot of people think it's like such a selfish thing to do to your family and all. And I can see where they're coming from because I used to think like that years ago until like I had similar feelings. Mm. Uh, but when you have them feelings, it's not like a selfish thing. It's like, I feel like a massive, like, I feel like my, I'm in like a, I'm in a deficit here. I'm not adding anything yeah, to the people around exactly me. That, mate. I feel like I'm a burden. I feel like well, everyone would be better off without me. But so that's like, it's hard when people say, oh, yeah, they're selfish when they do that. Because they're not. It's actually trying to be... You feel like you're trying to be mate. selfless when you're feeling like that in a you, weird kind of way, don't you? You want to, you want to take the pain away, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you want to take the pressure off these people. And, like, the way, certainly, like, about three or four years ago, like, the way I was looking at it is, like, all I'm doing, all I'm bringing is more hassle, more pressure, more stuff to do more frustration, everything, and it's all stemming from me. So if I'm not here, then, yes, it'll be difficult for a bit. But the long term is going to be so much better. Everyone will be better off. Everyone will be happier, etc. And, look, I felt like that a, a, a lot. One of the the main two things which stopped me from ever really taking it further was her and also the fact that I know what it was like to be 16 with a 12 year old brother and have my dad taken away from me yeah like that fucked me up for the last like 20 years it took me 20 years to deal with it 20 years to get my head around it and he died from like a heart condition he didn't kill himself. Imagine what that would do to my 
three kids or it, my mum, you know, it's... It would definitely leave that guilty feeling God, tenfold, imagine, wouldn't it? Compared yeah. to just someone naturally going like, yeah. yeah. So that was that. Was that. Um, and then a friend of mine who runs um, an MMA and uh, wrestling website in America, um, Sean Mossap, shout out to him, Fightful.com, very good site. Plug. Um, they... Um, I did a like a podcast. They had a Patreon, and I joined their Patreon because I liked their stuff and I wanted to support them. They were quite new, and one of the Patreon tiers, you could do a podcast, um, like with them, and, and you just go on and have a chat over Skype or Zoom or whatever. And I did it, and I was so excited to go on and just talk to him because I liked him anyway, and we'd spoken a bit on DM, um. And the, I remember the the build up to it. I was like researching all this stuff. Oh, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about that. We didn't talk about any of it, but I was so excited, and I hadn't felt like that for so long. And we talked for like an hour or forty five minutes or something about wrestling and stuff. And it was you know nothing groundbreaking, just chatted. Um, and I finished. And I remember like afterwards, I was so buzzing. I was so like. Hadn't felt like that for so long, and I was like, uh, I should, I would love to do. I reckon I could do. I reckon I could, you know, the equivalent of like Zoom calls and stuff. And like, I know a few f- people. Like, I know a few fighters and footballers and stuff. I, 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 I think I could do that. I should do it on YouTube, shouldn't I? And I thought about that for about eighteen months, maybe even two years. Just thought about it. Like most nights, I'd be like, yeah, I could do this, and I could do a series on this, and I could do a series on that. Or I could just do a podcast on this. It just went on around all these different things. And eventually I just got to a point. I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I just literally there and then just made the channel. Threw together a little bit of art. And someone who I used to go to school with, I don't know how I even ended up talking to him about it. But we did. And he kind of threw together a logo, like the first logo, which the channel had is like just like this blue and yellow thing. And I can't fault him because he made it for me. He didn't have to do it. He spent a while on it. And that meant a lot to me because I was, like, buzzing and excited to do it. And, like, it just randomly happened to be speaking to this guy who I used to go to school with, Richard. And he really helped me out in that in first week. Like, and um, so, yeah, just started doing podcasts. Um, so I think, like, a lot of the early ones, I think the first four episodes, I did um, an episode on called ADHD and Me. So it was with this guy uh, on Twitter who I'd seen on Twitter called uh, ADH Father, ADHD Father. Um, his name's Jacob, who I'm really good friends with now. Um, and he's got ADHD. And um, he's, he had at the time, he had a young young child. The child's grown up a bit now. Um, and we just talked about the impact of ADHD on him. Yeah. And I talked about the fact that my oldest son's got uh, the impact on him, how difficult I found it as a father and not knowing how to deal with it and getting frustrated, you know, all this different stuff. Great. Next episode was me and my mate, uh, or two of my mates, just talking about football. Uh, the next episode, I think, was with um, an Irish football journalist I knew. All of these were, like, on Skype. And then I did one with Johnny Owen, I think, as well, who I was friends with on Facebook and stuff. And I was just like, can you help me out? And he was like, yeah, go on. And then suddenly I was like, People are actually watching this. Yeah. So then I kind of just started thinking of ideas. And I think the early days was like I had a conspiracy theories, uh, conspiracy theory series, just me and my mate looking at different conspiracy theories. Um, and I wanted to do, I was just, and then I would just like interview people. So like I'd interview like um, Andy Campbell, ex Cardiff City hero. Um, and again, like one of my absolute idols, like I was there at the Millennium Stadium when he scored that goal. One of my best friends. Yeah. It's just like wild to me that like how things kind of developed. So like I, I did an interview with him, like a podcast with him, just had him as a guest and we chatted. And he got on really well, talked about his career and stuff. And then about a week later, I was like, I really, really I'd like, quite like to do a championship um podcast don't see many of them like you see premier league and 
Everyone Champions after the big yeah, names, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Championship, I think, is really enjoyable to talk about, watch about. So I just hit, hit him up and said, do you fancy it? Yeah. And then when lockdown comes, so we did that. We did, like, every week we'd do an episode. We eventually went live because we were getting more and more viewers and listeners. And then lockdown came. No football. So we sort of got together and said, right, We've either got to knock it on the head or we've got to do something different because there's no football to talk about. So you've got to change it up. So he was like, shall we get like a different footballer or coach or manager on, have them on live. People can ask them questions in real time. Hour and a half of just talking about their career, interviewing, anecdotes, all that good stuff. And we thought, yeah, let's give that a go. Kev McNaughton on, who had been on a different show for me previously, but he came on with me and Andy. Um, and we had all these different footballers. It's too many to mention. Graham Kavanagh, Emil Heskey, uh, uh, Graham Jones, who's now manager of Newcastle as of today because of um, Steve Bruce's sacking. Like we had him on. Um, just there's so many, too many to, to mention. So many that I can't think of the bloody individual yeah ones. mate like, you've done like hundreds of shows haven't you and i want to say anyone who's watching now make sure to head over and give them a subscribe and, and check it out as well because you do mma shows as well don't you, you yeah do, mma uh, and boxing show on a sunday with um former cage warriors champion um danny batten which again i met him so i interviewed him we got on really well and it was like would you like to do a weekly kind of show and again we changed that up a little bit after lockdown to bring in guests because there wasn't as much stuff going on. And to be fair, the guests and the, and the mixing it up has really helped. Like we've had some massive guests on there, like from boxing and, and uh, the MMA and stuff. But like, I remember at the start when I said podcasting saved my life, like that's what I mean. Like I'm sure like, if I watch this back, the excitement, as soon as I start talking about like those those early days and what it made me feel like, like it gave and it's given me like something which I can do. Um, I can do it around my own health. I can do it around my Crohn's. I can do it around my pain. I can do it for my house. I can do it around my own mental health. And But this weird thing happened, and I was saying this to you just before we started recording, where it, it started, it was just a thing to help me. And then it just kept growing and kind of growing and growing. And I think on Facebook, there's like, got like 10,000 followers or something stupid, like which I know is not massive to you know some channels and people. But like to me, like just a guy who did that because he wanted to help his mental health, mental mental and like it's mental to me that i'm up here talking to you whose podcast i watch and we're just talking about all the crazy shit which happened to me like do you know what i mean it did it's just it's weird to me but like i love it and i love doing it and like now like my two closest friends are like andy campbell and rodri giggs Makes no sense to me whatsoever. It's, it's a crazy world, isn't it? Yeah. Mate, I, I'm so chuffed for you that, like, you've done it. It's taken off. You know, you, you're doing really well, mate. People don't understand, right? Like, I don't know, you've got almost, like, 3,000 subs on YouTube or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a lot of hard work, isn't it? Like, people don't it's know. A and, ballache, mate. Yeah, and for you, <laughs> you know, putting out three, four, five shows some weeks, that's a lot of work that people don't see goes in behind that it's not just the the hour or two you you turn up for it's making sure the equipment's right it's making sure the guests are turning up there's a lot of talking to people before they come on yeah but like like just us now to get this arranged or whatever it's like how many messages have we sent back and forth probably a hundred in like yeah. you know that's last it, couple mate. of months like and that's that's mostly down at me because i'm useless but it's just the way it goes isn't it? Yeah, and, the, it, people it, don't realize how much effort it goes into it like i was saying to you with like the editing the setup the 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 lights, everything which goes into making it, recording it, but also it's the, the stuff afterwards. And like, even when you've made it and you've recorded it and you've edited it, you still got to put it out. You still got to promote it because if you just put one post up saying, oh, uh, 
new episode of the Rodri Giggs podcast. Yeah, you might get a couple of people watch it, but you've got to like, you've got to hit it out there. Where you've got to put clips out there. You've got to promote it on different social media platforms. You've got to try and hit people to find new viewers, and that's the hardest thing. Like those, I'm so proud of those two thousand. I think it's two thousand nine hundred and ninety or something subscribers on YouTube, more so than I am of the Facebook ten thousand. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong, I love those 10,000 people. I'm just, it's amazing to me that the, they follow the channel. But the YouTube ones, it was a struggle. Yeah. A struggle, mate, to get to that 2,000. And I know some people, they fly, don't they, from zero to a million and stuff. But you know what? There's nothing more. I say it's helped. It has helped me. But there's nothing, there's nothing more demoralizing, mate, than. If you think you've got a banger of a guest or a show and you put it all together, you've recorded it, you've had that you think this is the one which people are gonna like this, this is the one that's gonna kind of get me a bit of um a bit of a boost and some more subscribers or whatever you want, and you go there and it's just the views are like one, two, like really slow. Like that's demoralizing as hell. What's weird is you'll do that. And the the one that you think is going to be a banger will do all right, and then one which you just think will be all right will do something stupid. Like the most viewed show on the YouTube channel for me is not even with a guest. It's me and I think it's me and Andy talking about last year, just round like talking about our favorite moments of the year. Yeah, it's got like uh, whatever it is. I think fifteen thousand views or something. Yeah, like it did. It's not like the Emil Heskey show or the Kev McNaughton show or the Rodri Gig show. Demetrius or Johnson yeah, or something yeah. like that, and it? That was crazy, exactly, mate. When I yeah. seen you having him on, I was like, this is mental. And not that you don't deserve it, but I was just like, it's, yeah, it's just crazy, a crazy mate, guest, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like him, so I did, yeah, Demetrius Johnson, and then in the same week I did Demetrius Johnson, um, Gary Toonan, who's fighting for the featherweight title in one in December. So last week... I interviewed him and the champion, uh, Than Lee. And, like, it's just mental to me. But, like, in the same week, I had um, Demetrius Johnson, Gary Toonin, and then um, Ar- Arjan Bula, who's the heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah. And I was just sat there, like, what has this become? Like, yeah. this was just me and my mate talking and, like, yeah. rambling on about football and stuff. And suddenly, like, I'm talking to these people. Like, Demetrius Johnson... Like, it's no exaggeration, I don't think, to say he's probably one of the greatest fighters that's ever lived. Like, he is, like, when people talk about their, if you ask, like, people from MMA and Bok, or particularly MMA, if you ask them, like, who's the best fighter of all time, nine times out of ten, he's in the conversation. For, for skill, like, because yeah. they're so, in them lighter weight classes as well, their skill level's so much higher than the, than the larger ones. do everything ones, quicker, mate. Yeah. But, I add him on, like, and it just... How does that happen? Like, like yeah. it's just, it's been a lot of, um, a lot of hard work and a lot of time consuming. You know, you've got to put the thing in. And uh, now I'm kind of, I'm at this weird thing at the moment where it's like, right, are you happy to just leave it as it is and, you know, just keep doing what you're doing? Or do you want to take that next step and maybe you know, build a studio and, and take really take it on and do something, like take it to that next level, invest a lot of money or more money because, as you know, podcast equipment costs money. It does. It's not cheap. Oh, no. Um, but I'm like at that little, I don't know what the word is, like a fork in the road. There's a crossroads. Because, yeah. Yeah. like, I could keep doing what I'm doing now and be happy. But... I also believe that, like what I was saying to you earlier, um, I can't remember if it was on or off, um, thing about when people see a clip and they see a clip of someone like me and you in a studio now, or they see a clip of me and Rodri speaking about football, but what is effectively a you know a Zoom call effectively. And um, I, th- I believe people are more likely to stop and watch the studio one because it looks more professional, it looks better, it looks all this, that, and the other. So that's something which I'm 
kind of like in my head I'm trying to get around and work with. And I've had a few guests who, you know, really big guests as well, who have said, as soon as you get a studio space, you know, I'll come down, I'll come down and I'll get involved and I'll come on. So it's like, right, let's do it. You you cannot got to be brave though, mate. Got to yeah. got to take that step. I'm, you, I'm not sure if I've got it in me at the moment. But you cannot under. For me personally, right, like I I can't talk on like your finances, doing all that for side of things. What I can talk on is the amount of connections you've made. You're never gonna have an issue filling that seat. Yeah, in the studio to tell people stories. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you're ever gonna have that problem. That was a problem which I envisaged doing this was like. I'm going to struggle to get people here. People aren't going to want to do it. Mate, I think I could do three or four a week if I wanted to in here, bringing people to this remote place where you are as well, based where you are. Not being funny, I don't think you're going to have any issues like in the slightest. Yeah, I am. Um, I've been, so I was offered um, use of a studio, a couple of studios actually recently. Like one of them I'm really quite interested in um, to do the show with Rodri because Rodri's in Cardiff a lot. Um, and we do that show on a Friday night live, which I know if we do in a studio, it, it does bring another set of issues because people like the live interaction, but we do it on a Friday night. Yeah. Now, can Rodri be away from Manchester on a Friday night to do a live show in a studio? I, I don't know. But it brings, like, there's a different set of um, things to manage. Like we were saying earlier, like you, sometimes you've got to contact one person and then you've got to contact another person to try and get out all three of you together at the same time. It's logistics, I suppose, change depending on what you're doing. But um, ultimately, mate, one thing I will say um, is even though I wish all my shows were in a studio, I wish they were because I stand by the content and I stand by the interviews which I've done. I've had Cardiff City Chairman Mehmet Dalman on my show twice. The only other place he has done an interview is like BBC, Guardian, and Talk Yeah, Court. it's cool, mate. Um, and I had him on live, and w I asked him proper questions. Like, I didn't dance around it. I questioned him, and the first time he came on, I was asking him about the death of Emiliano Sala, um, you know, the, the transfer fee, the plane. I asked him some hard questions, and I know people think, particularly at the moment, where Cardiff are and what's happening with the club, people think he's a bit of a bullshitter. But, like, this is the way I look at it, is he came on my show twice, and people could ask him anything they wanted. They didn't ask him. That's not his fault. Yeah. I asked him everything I wanted to ask him, and he answered it. If you want to ask him something different, ask when he comes back on. Because he's coming back on. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, no, look, I'm proud I'm proud of the fact that he came on not once but twice because that's a mad connection again to me. Like Cardiff City Chairman. Yeah, definitely me. It's just a weird one, isn't it? But like I said, well that's sorry, that's what I I I ramble. I apologize. <laughs> that's all good. We'll probably mate. have it's to cut good. this show mate, like by like three I don't hours. cut anything to be honest with you. It's all for me, it's all about just sitting down having a chill conversation yeah. with someone. I feel like it's to get to know the people get to know a little bit of insight to their life. Hopefully then from like what you've talked about, you've talked about like you growing up, taking drugs from whatever, your trauma, the car accident, and now you found something. Like for me, the story, the crux of the story is you've now found something that inspires you, makes you want to live another day. It's going to drive you forward to live like a good life. And now you're looking to keep growing. You're setting goals all the time. You're expanding like your knowledge, your circles, the people you, you all know like, you know, directly bothering them, but having a Zoom call with these people, it's like, it's just feeding your brain all positive information all the time. Because all these people, you're not having people on who are like moaning about Barbara next door, are you? You're having people on who are... Yeah, I like, did a, sorry, I did a mental health show um, series, like a mini series, mental health, where each um, each episode would be focused on a different mental health disorder. And I had someone on who had that disorder. So we had a lady with... Um, DID, multiple personalities disorder. I met like listening to her story and, and talking about like why someone would have like that disorder and like the difficulties which come with it 
on a just a day to day basis, and even not thinking about the, you know, the reasons and the trauma that caused it, just the day to day issues with having fifteen personalities or whatever, and they can take over or change and stuff during you know it's um we did you know different mental health things but when i did um a show on depression and grief with um irish journalist uh, phil brown who's a very very good friend of mine someone who's helped me tremendously um i got so much time for him he um so he's like uh, he does um beyond the pitch podcast um this is like an irish football journalist and um he uh, his wife died uh, a few years ago. Um, clearly you know, traumatic and stuff. Um, he had some issues, and we did a show. It is basically like two hours of me and him talking about our addi- uh, addiction issues, grief, and like really like therapeutic. Like when I finished that show, it was like a massive weight had been lifted off my shoulder. Yeah, and we hadn't even planned it like that. We just said. We were going to kind of talk about what happened to him and, and addiction and stuff like that as part of the mental health series. Um, and with those series comes messages from people. Um, and I've had, I think, two or three messages um, when I've talked about mental health or my own difficulties or I've spoken to, like, Keith Gillespie about his issues with gambling um, and a few other different athletes who've had sort of similar issues with addiction or mental health. Like people send you messages and they're they're saying like how much has touched them or how they they were struggling today and they've just watched this and it's really like made them realise that they're not on their own and it's yeah. made them realise that when you're at your lowest you can still drag yourself back up uh, like it's never too late and that's what I always say in those shows is it's never too late like no matter. It's not. It's not too late to come back from the edge. Um, yeah, if you've still got air in your lungs and uh, your heart's still beating, you're 100%. still here, aren't you, mate? And and sometimes I feel like uh, it's it's just like any you looking at it like this is just going to take away all my pain. It's going to be like it's going to be easier for everyone. It's going to be an easy way out, but it's not though. That, that's going to leave a lot of pain behind us. Also, like you said, if you can find something that inspires you, just like you have now, like that podcast now, there was something in you that was meant to happen, wasn't it? You took that leap to jump paid to get on that podcast to now look where you are now. And it's just like one little thing. Like it's like a match in it. You throw a match and then next thing you know, you've got this massive fire, like haven't you? Creativity just comes then, doesn't it? Like once you start, um, once you start coming up with ideas and things like that, like it just flows, doesn't it? Like yeah. it just takes one one idea, one thing. And like I don't know, it's it's madness to me. Like that it's where it is. And like I know, you know, I know s- some people will kind of look from the outside and they'll say, Oh, so you're like a small channel, blah blah blah. But like everything about it is real, it's built on real conversations with real people. Yeah, and when you see those people, ex footballers, ex fighters, current fighters, whatever it, you know, whoever, Cardiff City chairman, like you, it's a real conversation between me and them. It's not like a formal interview, like what you'll see on a Sky Sports or something like that. And that's why I enjoy your stuff so much because it's a, it's a conversation. It's not you going. Oh, so when did you do this or what did you do that? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just a question and answer thing. That's not natural. Like, I want to... I don't want to put pressure on... Like, yeah. there's certain things we want to get out of this, right, that we want to talk about and, like, we'll take it back to points where I think need mm. elaborating and whatever. Absolutely. But then, at the same time, I feel like er- everything good comes in com- Like, not everything good comes in comfort, but us being here, being comfortable with each other will give the most open and honest conversation you're going to get. Because you're going to feel happy to share. You're not going to feel like I'm... i got no ill intent with anyone who comes in here. I, I actually, like, when... You know, you got to get, like, clickbaity and stuff. Yeah, right? you have to. You have to. And, like, I'm probably going to clickbait this. You hate it, though, don't you? I hate it, mate, because I feel like I'm doing a disservice to what this person's saying. But at the yeah. same time, I'm like, where's the disservice? Is it by being clickbaity? So people watch people, it. Yeah, but you want people... You need the people to watch it to do it justice. To get, to get the value. So you're like... Yeah. 
it's like caught same the it's like the situation with social think, media like you're caught in a rock rock in a hard place aren't oh you yeah big time i wish i could bin off social media now now they, i'm trying to think of a particular example there was one um there was just something recently like a clip and i i had to clip it and i had to word it the way it was worded but i didn't want to because it sounded so much worse than what it was even though what like what you, you know, what the way I had worded it was exactly as it was said, and I can't remember what it was, and it's going to bug me. And then what will happen is I'll remember the second we stop recording, I'll be like, oh yeah, it was that. <laughs> I know, I'm exactly the same as that. I know, well, I've done clips like that, and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I bought smack on my payday. It was like when yeah. I I did for like Cullen. He, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about like he wants people to see it. His yeah. story. I don't know if you you heard it, but. Uh, off the have, guy yeah. off the Central Club. Yeah, yeah, I have. He's coming. Um, he's doing an episode of the My Story series with me. Um, next month. Oh, so, awesome, uh, mate! Yeah, yeah, that'll be that. cool. He's got a, he's got an awesome story. But yeah, like I I knew his personality, the way he take, he's so open and honest. It wouldn't be a problem to him. But I know, like some people, I would really. Yeah, you don't want to upset people, do you? Like at the end of the day, like people have travelled up to, to see you and give you their time and stuff and, and they've given me their time to speak to you and they'll give you like an hour and a half or, th- or two hours or whatever they, you know, whatever they give you, they're giving you their time to t- tell their story and what you don't want to do is you don't want them to think that like you're taking a piss and they're like yeah. just trying to use their name to like just get, do you know what I mean? There's, there's not many people that's come away from this when I'm doing this that I don't feel like I've built a kind of friendship with either. It's not yeah. like it would just say, it's not, this isn't forced for the cameras or anything. This That's isn't it, yeah. forced for anyone to watch. This is like, this is genuine. Like I'm not yeah. putting on an act or anything. Yeah, that's it. And and like, uh, here's a question for you then, mate. Let's turn around. And Let's go. Sure. Have you had any guests which have like been difficult to get going, like get them talking? Yeah. <laughs> what did you do to get around? Like, how did you just keep sort of? Try and keep the conversation going, and then eventually they relaxed. It was probably more in the early days, to Hit be honest. Stick. Yeah, yeah, give them a kick under the table. It was more in the early days, to be honest, because I was just like, ah, oh, I just like second guess myself all the time. And and I can remember I did one right, and this is like one a standout one for me, which bugs me to this day because he's like one of my biggest guests. Uh, I had Andy Powell on, the rugby player, right? I don't know anything about, not that I don't know anything about rugby, but I'm not into rugby. I'm into Same MMA and things like that, right? Same. I'm not, I'm not into football either, so but I'm literally purely like MMA, bit of boxing, like if it's the right fight, you know, yeah. bit of a fear weather fan with that. But then, so I had him on because of his like personality more than anything. But then in my head, all the prep I was doing was like rugby based and I wasn't enjoying that. And then yeah, when he came in, cool. I was trying to act, ask him questions about like rugby and all. And I was trying to be more of like an IF, do you watch IFL TV? And yeah, things yeah, like. yeah. I was trying to be like more of that sort of, thing than than like I am now and that was like and also the thing is sometimes what people don't realize is there's no one there today but I've had people in the background before there was two people in the background that day which I'm really comfortable around but having more people in the room makes it a little bit weird sometimes yeah but I think it just adds that little bit of um just a little bit of pressure just because there's more people in the room it's natural isn't it but I think it takes you a while like they took me I would say probably 15, 15 of the episodes that I was doing to really feel comfortable just to just to, to, to talk and to do things. Like, I don't like the sound of my voice. I said that to you as soon as I put the headphones on, which is, you know, it's crazy if you're yeah. doing podcasting, but I just don't. But, like, it took me about 15 episodes, I think, to just be comfortable in, and kind of get right, am I going to try and be a bit more formal or am I going to just do it as me and that's it? And that's what I do and that's what you do because you just be you. And, like, of course, like, sometimes I'll tidy up my language a little bit and, you know, maybe... Yeah, yeah. Turn the volume up a little bit, maybe. Like, Yeah. Yeah, no, I... And that's, that's what I didn't do with that. And I was, like, afterwards when the, he left... um all respect to him, we got on great, right? It, I'm not like it wasn't. A lot of people enjoyed it, right? Mm. He's like a big guest, did did good views, proper sound guy. Like the interactions before and after, proper sound. We hung out for a little bit, like, and yeah, it was yeah. a good laugh, like. But me and my brother spoke afterwards, and I was like, from that night, I was like, this podcast isn't about. It is kind of about what people have achieved and things, 
but like I don't I'm not going to know everything about rugby I'm not a rugby sporter uh, and so I take that concept of everything I do like I had a vegan guy on here the other week like I'm here to talk about life and how that impacts you and what like what makes you tick what makes you grow what make all the, all these different things right and to tell life stories mm. because I'm not going to be able to relate to everything but I I can relate to life because everyone's living it right and feelings are feelings and that's just like my concept on things I feel like I can connect with people really well doesn't matter what you do right and that's that. So I had to take that concept on now, and that's what I'm doing from here on out. Is just trying to just talk about life, really, and whatever happens and whatever flows, it's going to come naturally. And I, I, don't, I don't put the pressure on myself now. I take it. I, I used to get like worked up before I come in. I'd be like, oh, "Who are my missus?" I'm like, "Ah, oh, I don't." Oh, like she'd be like, "Ah, oh, could you do that for me?" And I'd be like, "Oh no, I've got to get ready for this. Got to get ready." All, all this stress state. Like I, now, I'm just like, "You right, mate? How's it going?" Like, yeah, mate. That that is that that hits perfectly to me like that's exactly what i was like i would be like on edge like beforehand because i'd be so pumped up and just like again like you say you this is or you, one of my kids would be like oh can you do this and you're like oh i gotta do it and you're not really doing anything just stressing, stressing yeah <laughs> and like the thing i like about the way that i do it and the way that you do it as well is yeah you might start with or where did you grow up or you will, I don't know you won a Champions League, whatever it may be. Like you, you might start with a specific story or a specific point, but from that point on the conversation can go anywhere, yeah. just wherever it goes. So if you've got someone like me who just rambles a little bit and then something will come up mid sentence and it will be like, Oh yeah. And then this and, and that, and the conversation before you know it, you started on football and you ended up on, I don't know, whatever mental health and yeah. all sorts of stuff like it's i like that i like the i like the randomness of it and i like the natural um growth of the conversation yeah and i think sometimes i wish more radio shows were like that is what i don't like about because i listen to so many podcasts now is what i don't like about the radio is that it feels forced a lot of the time like I listen to talks more sometimes in the car and stuff, and it feels very, like, almost scripted all the time. Like yeah. I, I'm going to say this, you're going to say that. We're going to. I'm going to argue this point. You're going to argue this point, and I. I you just know it's not genuine. It's not off the cuff, is it? Yeah. You can tell. Like they're over animated. They're false characters. They're not being themselves, and that's why I love like watching Joe Rogan because he has them in there for like three hours. There's no way they will expose themselves at some point if they're a bullshit artist, wouldn't they? Yeah. 100%. Same as now. We've been in here an hour and a half, right? That's flown by. Jeez, it's like it's gone real quick. Got it, it? You couldn't hide yourself talking for no. that long. Can you? No way. No way. Because it's too, it's too tiring, mate, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean, like, <laughs> it's like just to like put on a, a persona for that long and like not have a break and not be able to just, I don't know. I find it. I find that weird. Anyway, it's something. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday, like um, who I won't name for obvious reasons, which you'll find out now. But like, um, I, f I was speaking to someone yesterday who's um, found out like that a um, father of a kid's ex partner has been cheating on his new girlfriend for like four years since they've been together, basically. And like I said to her, like I just I don't get it. Like, I, d I don't understand it. I don't understand the logic of it. Um, Of, like, if you don't want to be with that person, just don't be with them. Expose them. Expose don't, them now. You don't, <laughs> no, you don't have to hurt uh, people, yeah. like, and, and, and turn everyone's world upside down. If you don't want to be with someone, have some balls and just say, I don't want to be with you. Don't yeah. ruin three lives by, like, cheating on someone. And it's something which I, I do struggle with. Like, these people are full of shit. Same, I've, mate. I've, I've got no time. I'm 40 in less than two weeks now, and I, I've i got about as little time for bullshit as ever. Yeah. Like, I really, like, sometimes I'll be, like, speaking to people, and if I feel like they're not being truthful or they're, like, embellishing stuff, I'm kind of almost, like, walking away from them. Like, I, I, I don't know whether it's an age thing, I'm getting grumpy as hell, <laughs> so like, I kind of just uh, I'm not in. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with this no more. 
go and tell it to someone who's young. I, but, I know exactly what you mean. And also, you know, if you've got their morals yourself, it's really hard. I hate it. Like, sometimes you have people who are, like, trying to glamorize like it as well. Do you? Oh, okay. And then I'm just like, yeah, cool, mate. Mm. Like, that's not... That's not what I'm down for. Like, you know, when I was like 18, it's a different story then. Yeah. When you're out on the piss all the time, you're not really settled down. You're just out for a laugh and whatever. You, you're like seeing people, there's nothing serious. But now, like, you know, like when it's someone who's got kids and things like that, I just can't, I can't look at them the same. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I'm just like, what are you doing? Like, if you're not, if, you, if you've got no respect for that person, like you obviously haven't got respect for that person, have you? Otherwise no, you would break up with them. Like you said, you'd, you'd grab your balls and you'd break up with them. Like, what are you doing it for? You're just being selfish. You just want the best of both worlds, don't they? But yeah. like, like I say, I, I struggle with it because I don't understand. I don't understand people in 2021's lack of empathy, like generally. Like I see people on Twitter um, and Instagram and places like this and the stuff that people say to each other, like sometimes it's to get a reaction, sometimes it's trolling, sometimes it's because they don't agree with someone's point. And I just don't understand, like, this. How can you not feel for that person in, even if you disagree with what they're saying, they're still a human being. There's still a person there. Yeah. And, like, I'm a big sort of believer of, like, you never know what's going on behind closed doors. And, like, you never know just because someone's giving it a big one in public. That doesn't mean they're all right. That doesn't mean that they're like confident and happy and everything when they go home. And I, like I know that from personal experience. Like I know um, a couple of people who took their own lives who you probably wouldn't have thought were kind of struggling in that way. Mm. Um, and like m- even myself, like before my injuries, when I before the accident, like when I was having sort of issues with depression or mental health when I was drinking too much and stuff like that, I could hide it easy. Yeah. Like in terms of if I could speak to people and they think I was the, like the life and soul of the party or whatever, or like, you know, laughing and joking and telling stories about last night's escapades and, you know, all this different stuff in, whether it's in work or in the pub, like I could hide that. But, um, yeah, you're just building up this, uh, fake persona of yourself yeah. to them though, aren't you? Like, you know, yeah. And I think some of that, of course, some of that comes with mental health and being ashamed and embarrassed and, and paranoid. It's a big thing. Do not do mushrooms, kids. That's what I say. <laughs> Just don't. But um, but also, like, what was I going to say then? Um, yeah, like, it's like... Um, It's all good, mate. It's all good. It happens, mate. The point went, I had it. It was a good point, and it's gone. (laughs) We're a fair way in, mate. I tell you what, this talking's exhausting sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, no, I... I, That's going to bug me as well. (laughs) I know know it was a good point, but I don't know what the point was. It's all good, mate. It's all good. People are twats, I think, is probably the gist of it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, mate, I think... uh, This is... You could, you can like fill your your feed up with like really positive things as well, can't you? Like that's what I've been trying to do recently. It's an effort though, isn't it? I've been trying to re- gotta really try. Well, yeah, because even the positive people, you know, like I I can have a moan, like I'm doing it right now, you know. It it happens, doesn't it? It's such like a, a human nature thing to do. But I think I always aim to try to be positive. But like you've got to suck people in with a bit of negative to get them to watch the positive as well. So it's like a weird divide, and we we see about it all the time. It's like um, you're just playing a game, really, aren't we? But uh, I just think. We keep pushing on, you know. Wales really, it's like underrepresented in every uh, facet, I think. Like, whether that be podcasts, musicians, s- just stars in general, isn't it? Like, you yeah. name, like, a really famous Welsh breakout star. Like, like boxing, MMA, anything, really. That is, like, on the world level, the world scene, you yeah. know. It's a really weird thing. Like, I, I think, um, I think I said this to you. Um, I know I said it to, um, Merkage, but I think I said it to you as well, is in my opinion, in the next sort of three to five years, you'll see like a bit of a Welsh takeover in uh, like hip hop and grime because there's some incredible talent out there. People like Merkage and T Rev um, and a few others, like really like yeah. top level stuff, really good stuff. Um, podcasting, me and you. 
yeah. take over and Joe them, Rogan, c- knock him off his throne. Let's go. Now, them Central Club boys as well, yeah, you know, they, absolutely they're killing mate, it. Absolutely, mate, 100%. Central Club. So like that, straight away, off the top of your head, you've got like three Welsh-based podcasts, which are doing good stuff, having good guests, having like doing things the right way. You've got these hip-hop artists, boxers like Cody Davis and... and um, Gavin Gwynn and people like that. Gavin Gwynn's already a, a Commonwealth champion. Cody Davis, in my opinion, will go on and be a world champion. Yeah. So talented. Then you've got Jack Shaw, who is literally, like, to me, is like a UFC champion in waiting. As soon as he starts fighting ranked fighters, in my opinion, he will just go up and up and up and up until he's there. He's that good. But then there's also a few others uh, knocking about in like the um, Welsh boys, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Oban up there uh, very soon. But Brad Johns, I think, is going to do some incredible stuff in Bellator as well. Um, that's why I just think podcasting, MMA, and uh, hip hop and grime is going to be a bit of a Welsh takeover. Over the I think so as well, mate. Bit. I think so. Yeah, you see, like some Mason Mason's fighting this weekend as Mason well. Jones. You would have fought by the time this goes out, but. You would have won by the time this goes out. But then, like Mason, like I saw um, a couple of uh, American fans saying, and like he was overhyped, and I was like, because he lost his first fight in the UFC, and it's like, no, yeah, but he lost his first fight. But have you actually watched the fight from start to finish? He was absolutely brutal, mate. I start it's just Mason was one of my first guests, and um, it's a weird thing, right? When you meet someone and then you watch them fight. It was like you find ha- it more stressful. Yeah, yeah. When you've like actually spoken to someone, I'm like, I'm watching him. I'm like, oh my, because that fight was a war as well. Yeah. And I was like, how is he still standing? Like, oh, he's an animal, mate. But do you know what? He's one of the, the nicest people I think I've spoken to in all my podcasts. Like, he's so sound. He's just like a real cool dude. But um, he um, he's another one, man. I think he'll probably go on and do some special stuff. He's got a person like a uh, really big. Personality be- yeah. behind him, and he he puts it like he knows what he's got to do to try and sell a fight, doesn't he? Oh yes, yes. which is good. He's um he's uh, he's gonna be a good one. But then the other thing I was gonna say as well is like I watched one of the Cage Warriors trilogies, and it was like um over the three uh, three days there was like four or five like lads on there who I had yeah like interviewed or was friends with and like it was really stressful like every day there was like two people fighting like Oban and it was like um Luke Shanks and and people Luke, who I know through Danny um and it was hella more stressful watching that trilogy that one than it was the one before yeah the one before I had just watched Paddy um make his return and win and Mason had won his first title belt and that was like ah oh, that's that was a good show the next one, I was like, oh, mate, there's like just too many of them. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? It yeah, is it's, weird. It's, uh, do you, strange. Do you watch um, that Rory Evans? Do you have him on your podcast? Uh, he was on on Sunday. Mate, That's I've never week. seen grit like that. Oh, mate, I messaged him after. His was leg like, was mangled. Like, I was like, the way you got going. through that fight and won was absolutely insane. I couldn't. I've never. I don't think. I've, well, I don't think I've ever seen someone who's just like wasn't gonna give up. Yeah, he was. Nothing was gonna stop him, was it? Unless they just, unless the uh, his opponent just like knocked him out cold, he wasn't uh, stopping. But like he was a re- he was actually a really good guest. Like we had him on last Sunday, um, and I, I I love fight Sundays. Like me and Danny, like we just have an hour talking to a, you know, to a fighter about their career, their start, whatever it may be. Like, and then we have like half hour just to round everything up from the night before. But it just it's quite a nice end to the weekend, like yeah, because you have all the fights from the Saturday or the Friday, and it's been good. And we've been, you know, I've been very, very blessed with guests, like fighter wise, like we had Paddy and um, obviously like Jack and 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 Jack's dad. And yeah, yeah, he's awesome. But like and and like all the um, so this week we've got Corey McKenna coming back on. Um, oh, wicked. She's living out in the States now, but she's like an absolute diamond and s- super talented UFC Welsh girl. I think she's put a word in me. I've been trying yeah. to get her to come on, but she lives in America, mate. I know. The problem, I've, so I've, been, I've uh, been saying, like, if you're coming back, come on. Yeah, but yeah. She's, I get no response. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll send her a text for you, mate. 
uh, I'll ask her on Sunday. I but um, yeah, when she comes back, can I get her on? I'll then, um, you want to get Rodri on there? That'd be cool. Do you say he's based in Cardiff now? Or? Uh, he lives in Manchester, but he's up, you know, he's up and down in Cardiff quite a lot. I don't know. It'd be probably be a bit of a trek for him up here, but you never know. He's never pretty, know. Pretty sound, mate. To be fair, um, I watched his uh, James English one. You know, yeah, mine was better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's. Um, I did when uh, way, way, way back with him. Um, like right, like from one of my early episodes, I sent him a message on Twitter. I sent him a tweet on Twitter and said, "Oh, Roger, would you come on my podcast, mate, and just talk about everything that's happened?" Didn't expect a response, let alone anything. And he DM'd me and said, "Yeah," and we done it over Skype, mate. And like the, um, it's not the greatest quality, like camera and stuff. I think I did it on my like my phone or something, and it's on Skype. But the the actual content, mate. Is really good. Like he's so funny, and he goes into all this detail about, um, you know, everything which happened with him and his brother, and, and all this different stuff, and the way his family treated him, like all that stuff. And he's so funny with it, and he's so brutally honest. And like doing those shows with him on a Friday every week at the moment is just like, I do not stop laughing for the majority of it because people will, because what we tend to do is like you have. 45 50 minutes of talking about football, and you know, Newcastle was like last week when I um getting taken over and all this. And then, um, the last like 10 minutes, people start like just slipping in any old question, like about anything. Um, and someone was asking him about his time in jail. Um, and you're like, Oh, it's a football show, well, we'll ask him. And, and he'll, you know, he's silent, he's just answering these questions, and he's just he's a very uh, he's a very laid back, like just sound guy. Yeah. But also brutally honest. Like he will tell you exactly what he thinks. And That's like good. His, his brothers come up a couple of times, you know, sometimes for football, because when we're talking about Wales and stuff, and he doesn't, um, doesn't skirt it. Like he answers it, you know. Um, yeah. That's what I thought about his James English one. He didn't care. He just went all in, yeah. didn't he? And uh, I can't come out on yours. I'll have to go back and watch that one. I did. Watch every Friday, mate. Yeah. Seven thirty. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a cool dude. Um, and like, I just like the way he conducts himself. Unfortunately, I just think that eventually he will end up getting a job in football because he's very knowledgeable. I think he's probably the, the vibe I get is that he's going to be a very good coach, or he'll get a job like somewhere else, like radio or something, because he's that good. But I'm going to enjoy my time with him. You'll have to uh, take you with him, won't you? Yeah, same with him. <laughs> One of them has got to take me with him, isn't it? That's it. But there are, mate. I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. You got anything you want to say before we uh, no, mate, call it? Thank you for having me. Um, I would like people to check out Away Day Apparel logo. It's my uh, my friend's brand. They do some lovely um, like clothing, t-shirts, wallets, caps, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So uh, a sneaky little one of those. But um, no, he's a real cool dude. He, he helped me a lot um, in like the early days of the podcast and stuff. Um, and yeah, he's one of the soundest, loyalest people I know. Shout out to Big Al. But um, apart from that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for having you, mate. And um, please keep up the good work with your podcast. Love. Will do, mate. Thank you. Same to you as well. Make sure to uh, check out Ace Podcast Nation. Like and subscribe to him. Like and subscribe to me. You know what to do. Thank you very much. Cheers, Sam. Appreciate it. Do it. Subscribe. Experience Real Podcast.